building product driven companies like, is like crafting kind of a love story with your users. How do you infuse heart into the product development process and, and what is essential for creating products that resonate with users? It's important, especially in the beginning when you build a product, to have at least, I would say, 10 to 20 customers on WhatsApp because you have to get to the point that you establish a relationship with them that close, right? That mm -hmm. you can ask them for like opinions, feedback very, very early on and then be like super close in developing together with them. Uh, the answers come most of the times when you stay close to the customer because you can create like an MVP, send it back, get a look, maybe a feedback very quickly over like a voice message on WhatsApp and yeah. then go back and forth. And uh, I think that's underestimated, but like super, super important. Welcome to the EU Startups Podcast. Sit back and enjoy the show hosted by Marcin Lewandowski. This episode of EU Startups Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. Are you building a business? Achieving compliance with frameworks like ISO 27001 and SOC 2 can help you win bigger deals, enter new markets, and deepen trust with customers. But this can also cost you real time and money. Vanta rhymes with Santa automates up to 90% of the work for the most in-demand frameworks, helping businesses get compliant quickly. And with over 300 integrations, you can easily monitor and secure the tools your businesses rely on. Join over 7,000 fast-growing companies that use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. To learn more about how Vanta works and to get 20% off, visit vanta.com slash eu startups that's vanta.com slash eu startups now kick back and enjoy the show hey everyone this is martin Lewandowski, and you're listening to the eu startups podcast my next guest is jessica holzbach um, jessica is a serial fintech entrepreneur and the ceo of pile capital a treasury solution helping startups and vcs to manage their treasury and reduce financial risk uh, before funding Pile Capital, Jessica co-founded Penta and served as its chief customer officer for over four years since its uh, inception to scale with over 30,000 customers, uh, 150 plus employees and more than 45 million in venture funding collected. Everyone, please give it up to the one and only Jessica Halsbach. Hi everyone, uh, excited to be on the show today. Awesome to have you on the show, Jessica. So, you know, okay, maybe let's start with how are you today? I am uh, fantastic, actually. I had a perfect, I would say, start into the day. So I'm currently in Cape Town and um, I woke up pretty early at, uh, I think, 5.30 and then hiked Amazing. up Table Mountain to have my coffee uh, mm -hmm. on the Table Mountain today and then start work. Awesome. And what, what brings you to Cape Town? Um, actually, I studied in Stellenbosch during my bachelor's, uh, yeah. so uh, it's a bit of like homecoming and I always like loved the country. Really? I think like, everyone that comes here, uh, they, they always want to come back. And uh, the second part to is it, it is that uh, we are, we're having a, like a bit of an experiment at Pile. And so mm -hmm. we're trying out what we call the remote January, um, because last year in January in Berlin, everyone was, I would say, sick all the time. You know, the yeah, yeah. was really low, energy level were low. So we said the whole January we close the office and everyone is like going to different locations. We commit on the same time zone and trying this out basically as a bit of an experiment. Amazing. I love the experiment. Like you got to let us know how it goes. Um, so Jessica, let's, let's kick things off. Um, every entrepreneur has some sort of a start button. What inspired you to hit yours? Um, it's a good question um, because I feel sometimes, you know, when you look back over your life, like all the dots seem to align in like a perfect story and like one thing led to the next and to the next and to the next. Um, but when you look to the front, it feels more like you go two steps forward, one step back, one step left, one step uh, right. So I would yeah. say retrospectively looking, I felt there were like early signs of me having a bit of entrepreneurial, um, yeah, I would say skills or like ambitions very early on. Because I remember my, my parents told me the first time I put like a backpack on my back and I went with a, sh a snow shovel outside and I had like a huge sign that they had to write me when it said like, I shovel your snow for like 10, 10 euros. And, uh, That's so cool. I've done that too. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> running running through our little um, city and I started shoveling snow and uh, yeah I mean we didn't earn much but it was um, was interesting uh, but I would say the more pivotal moment in my life was actually that uh, I studied in my bachelor's finance mm -hmm. went into consulting um, and worked for banks uh, doing their I would say like digital strategy yeah. uh, and then I left to do my master's because I wanted to go abroad again so I studied mm -hmm. in Portugal and in Brazil um, and I did feel when I came back that I wanted some change because I really I felt I got told a lot of times that uh, I am a bit stubborn and that you know like if I have an opinion I really fight mm -hmm. for it and I also want to take over the responsibility for it and I just felt that being an entrepreneur it's much more like owning your own fate like you take yeah. decisions uh, but you also have to yeah you, you also have to take, take the responsibility for them if they don't work and mm -hmm. back then I decided very deliberately against a job and being an ent entrepreneur and uh, having no money at all. And I felt everyone kept telling us, oh, it's so easy to become an entrepreneur when you still study because you're used to not having money. But honestly, it was quite hard. I think the only thing that saved me was all the events in Berlin where you got free food. Um, so it was a bit of a hard time, but I think it was the time when I decided this is what I enjoy, I enjoy most, this is really what I, what I love doing. Amazing. So Jessica, um, you started in finance, as you already mentioned. Um, then took a leap into fintech entrepreneurship. What actually made you real, realize that fintech was the arena where you wanted to make a difference? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, I was working for a couple of years for a consultancy and uh, we mm. did kind of the digital strategy for banks. And back in the time, I would say, it was even called digital customer management. So the main thesis was what happens in the future? Will there still be mm. branches and how do you serve your customers? And yeah. while we had these crazy suggestions to that there might be no branches and you do customer service online, uh, everyone didn't believe it. Like all the major banks were like, ah, a nice idea, but you know, this will never happen, for mm. example, for, for business customers. And um, I just felt there was so much resistance against change and there was everything was so slow. It was like so frustrating. At the same time, I felt like most of the people didn't have an incentive to change, you know, because especially if you're a manager or if you're working somewhere, you're not really rewarded for like trying something new or like creating change. You're more, I would say, punished if things go wrong. And right. so I just felt there's like a huge opportunity with this new technology, with like things that can be done different, with like a new generation of uh, consumers coming up that you mm -hmm. could create companies that do things differently but you had to do it from the outside you couldn't do it within the organization so uh, that was actually my decision to then go into fintech because i always loved finance i always loved capital markets and money movements and what it actually can do to an economy uh, and that's why i um yeah somehow ended up in fintech awesome i love the story um jesse cap so was penta your uh first venture yeah, that's uh, the, the one detour I took. Um, so it was not my first venture. Uh, we actually started, besides the snow shoveling, uh, I um, did uh, import acai berries because I mentioned I was in Portugal and Brazil. <laughs> nice. So we did like bring acai berries to, to Berlin. And it was the time of superfoods and, you know, 2006 to 2007 was the time of, um, I would say, e-commerce startups mainly. And mm -hmm. you mainly took something and tried to sell it online. And maybe you would, it was also the time of glossy box. So you would put it into a box mm -hmm. and then sell it online. So we wanted to do like acai breakfast box. And, uh, but the whole thing, I mean, we got like, I think 20K in angel invest. Uh, back then which was still a lot of money for us um, mm. and it felt quite fast I think we were like in total six months and then I realized I really want to go back to fintech because for me I have to say even though I'm always the responsible person for growth marketing sales customer service mm. I didn't enjoy the whole influencer Instagram part that was mainly mm. coming with the superfood and you know lifestyle brand that I was creating so I feel much more comfortable with banking people somehow all right so let's talk about penta then um so penta's growth journey is quite remarkable um you know what's a behind the scenes story during your time as chief customer officer that kind of encapsulates the spirit of uh, and challenges of building penta and, and what do you think is the uh, secret sauce for penta's success 
Um, I think what was, I mean, I feel like everyone thinks they were a bit different. It was like a wild journey, but we, I felt mm. we were a bit different. It was a wild journey. Um, so we were like five founders in the beginning, which I think was quite a lot. Uh, everyone mm. like mentioned that. But the nice part was that we were all experts in our area or we had at least like very strong um, opinions in one area so we were very building very much in parallel and I think that's actually the second part or second and third part um, so I joined and did exactly what I wanted to do in theory for the banks I wanted to build up this like very customer centric very um, customer focused uh, online bank and I was like from day one very deliberately designing this journey in which we would take care of every customer so I was speaking to um, to like a, actually a VC from uh, Berlin like I think half a year ago and she was saying oh back then I opened my first Penta account and I was surprised that like you answered me personally within five minutes on my email and like uh, tried to solve my problems I think that was very much the spirit of, of Penta like we took every complaint every customer super serious like whether it's you know dinner at the evening like you were always on your phone like always trying to fix everything but it was also really really i would say exhausting so i think we were young very high energy levels and very very committed and like failure was just not an option at all which is like i think we all would have done anything to make this successful so um yeah it was quite hard work i would say Amazing. Um, so Jessica, what actually, so funding file capital is like to me, like crafting a financial masterpiece from your side. So what sparked the change um, from Penta to, to Pile and how Pile is actually reshaping the treasury landscape for startups and, and BC? Yeah, I feel like my journey is also a bit in line with maybe what I want to see as change in the banking world, but also what I'm seeing with like change in, in, in how, how we bank. Because I started with traditional banks, then I built Penta as like a neo bank. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like we are now at a point, you know, like that we basically digitized the first processes. So yeah. we took, I think like a very good example is for example, calendars. Like in the beginning you have offline calendars, right? Then you start to digitize them and you start to like have maybe your uh, Google calendar or your whatever Chrome. I think it's now bought by, by Notion. And yeah. um, all of a sudden it's possible to build use cases on top of this like digital layer, right? Like you can book in appointments you can put in ai you can like really like start creating use cases on top of this digitalized service and i feel the same i'm trying to do with banking now so first they were banks then we digitized them into neo banks and now we have the basis of it with like open banking we have like neo banks we have banking as a service and with pile we're actually trying to build something on top of that so we're building now this treasury solution which is actually in the end like a software piece that helps founders and finance managers to better, I would say, steer their finances, you know, gain some interest, optimize the whole bit and piece. But in the end, we're building use cases on top of the digitalized neo banks. So I feel we're in this actually quite, quite, quite exciting, exciting time for fintech. Um, that it's like the first time that we can leverage new technologies, you know, AI, open banking, all of this, and build like really, really exciting banking use cases on top of the, what we finally have digitalized. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Jessica, you've been at the forefront of companies that prioritize both growth and customer satisfaction. How do you strike the balance between scaling rapidly and ensuring that the customer remains at the heart of the product and the company? Yeah, uh, I feel the because you can't be ju like jumping on the customer calls as you were. Ju you just gave us this example um, that they were surprised when they you know opened the first account and then like you were in within five minutes uh, answering their uh, request. But you can't keep doing that, right? Yeah, I feel like it's. Probably like you have to put your money where your mouth is in a sense right like you have mm -hmm. to um i feel like a lot of people don't really invest into for example customer relationship management um so yeah. it's more like something you do on the side um and you don't put like any capital or any like resources behind it the mm -hmm. same like obviously you know has to happen on the marketing side and then the growth side you will not get any growth if you don't invest into good people or into like the, the, the steps that are necessary to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, while I am fully in line with, you know, you have to invest in tech and building the product, you will not yeah. like growth and like customer centricity will not happen magically or automatically. You know, you actually have to invest into it. And I think what helped in the past is if you kind of create C-level commitment for it, right? Like in the past, I wasn't the, the CEO of, of Penta. I was the chief customer officer, right? So I, on a C-level, um, had the commitment of creating a company that is super customer centric. And I think that helps. Um, yeah, that, that was probably the, the ugly answer to it, that you have to invest uh, some money in terms of money, hiring people or resources uh, into it. Got it. And what, so let's maybe talk about building uh, product-driven companies. Um, because, you know, to me, building product-driven companies is like crafting kind of a love story with your users. How do you infuse heart into the product development process? And, and what is essential for creating products that resonate with users? Yeah, I think it, it goes also in line with um, being close to the customer. So really having, I would say, um, no, like the, especially the product team or like, um, you know, within my, uh, my, I have a CPTO, right? Like there has to be like no friction in like creating customer touch points. So I, I always said like, it's important, especially in the beginning when you build a product to have at least, I would say 10 to 20 customers on WhatsApp. And because you have to get to the point that you establish a relationship with them that close, right? That mm -hmm. you can ask them for like opinions, feedback very, very early on and then be like super close in developing together with them. Um, it is obviously true that customers will not, um, well, depending on the customers you build for, for example, we build a lot for, for startups and founders. And they mm -hmm. always tend to jump very uh, quickly into the solution mode. So they tell you, I want this solution, or I want that feature. There you have to be a bit careful to really understand the problem. So always go down to like, what is the real problem? What's the real pain point? Um, mm -hmm. And how can I like start solving that? And also what would this be worth to, to the person? And I think the answers come most of the times when you stay close to the customer because you can create like an MVP, send it back, get a look, maybe a feedback very quickly over like a voice message on WhatsApp and yeah. then go back and forth. And uh, I think that's underestimated, but like super, super important. Awesome. I love it. Um, Jessica, I know that you're also a um, an angel investor. Um, so, you know, as an angel investor, you're you're planting seeds for future growth. Uh, what excites you the most about supporting early stage fintech and I know you also into you're also into health tech companies and can you share maybe a story of uh, you know of a venture you've invested in that really resonated with you yeah um, so I started angel investing I would say in the like end of my penta days and then also in like the break between a uh, penta and starting a pile um, mm -hmm. I would say also like maybe as an advice, it takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, so it's nothing, uh, for example, at the moment, I'm a bit less active, I would say. Yeah. I'm still doing investments, but it, like building a company in parallel is just like, <laughs> it's my main priority, right? And right. so I fell like really in love when I had a lot of time. So in between doing nothing, I was actually starting doing angel investments. And yeah. um, all the companies I invested to, I actually love. Um, Maybe let's take uh, Ivy as an example. So I do mm -hmm. think I was even the first commitment uh, that, or the first investor that said yes to Ivy, maybe first or second, I have to actually ask Ferdi. Um, they're bu building this like account to account payment um, product, like also leveraging open banking. And uh, at the time I invested, I was mainly, um, I would say excited by the team. They were like really young, just out of university but you could sense that they're very committed and that they really, um, I don't know, I had a feeling that this is going into the right direction. And they did, I would say, change a very, very tiny bit from what they initially pitched, but uh, they're very successful in what they're doing because they're also mm -hmm. building very fast, iterating with the customer, getting customers, learning, mm -hmm. very, very open-minded in taking advice and feedback, but at the same time, building their own opinion. So I think that's a really, exciting company also to follow awesome um so there's so yes yeah, like every successful startup superpower is team uh i see and um 
But also you said that there was a bit of a gut feeling that, yeah, you're on the, on the right track with what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I, because I, I mean, I do have, I think at, at some point I tried to sit down and learn um, what is this gut feeling? Because gut feeling is always like a mix of experience and I yeah. feel like you do have a mental model, right? You apply. So I try to retrospectively write it down and learn with every investment that I'm doing. And I try to, especially in the very, very early deals, like I try to assess the team and the skills, like hard skills and soft skills. Yeah. Uh, because in the, in the beginning, it is mainly the team, right? The market has to be big. That's maybe one thing I would, um, you know, like if there's like an amazing team, but they're like really trying just to change, like a, I would say like 10 million market, I would yeah. not invest. Um, so that's more like a hygienic criteria that you have to chase like a really, really big opportunity that has to excite me as well, because I want to spend time on it. Um, but the, the other part is really like, you know, how... Um, how much drive do the founders have, right? Like how much also energy do they bring? Can they, in the times that it gets really, really stressful, keep going? Are they actually able to convince other people to join them and work for them, even they're maybe yeah. 20 years old, right? So I think there are like a couple of things that I'm trying to evaluate and um, then also mainly invest into, yeah, mainly the team, but also awesome. the market has to work. This is Jessica, since we were um, already talking about uh, early stage founders just taking off on their journeys um, you know for the fintech dreamers uh, ready to embark on their entrepreneurial journey what's what's the you already uh, said a few things about it but maybe you can add on it uh, what's the golden nugget of advice you'd toss into you know their treasure chest and and how has maybe if also it helped you in the past like how has this gem shaped your own um, adventures in the fintech realm yeah, um, I think one very practical advice is mm -hmm. um, to create commitments and to start yeah. like making them um, fast and you can start with smaller ones and go bigger. But um, the mistake I did with my very first startup or not mistake, but like I was very hesitant to make commitments. Because, you know, like you're very unsure, will this idea work, right? And mm -hmm. it can start with easy things like you first you know um create like a commitment that you um maybe buy a website right like you invest whatever like uh yeah. let's say 20 euro then maybe you run a couple of ads so you start like investing mm -hmm. a bit of money then you quit your job right like which is one of the biggest steps you actually have to do because i think i've seldomly seen a startup really taking off where people do it on the side um mm -hmm. because you don't create enough commitment for yourself and boundaries to make it happen right i think this just has to continue you know even convincing the first person to quit their job and join you is also like another commitment that you create that like forces you to keep going right registering your company incorporating putting this like initial capital down um, maybe giving your first interview online um people i feel like people always think it's just fun uh, to give like online interviews but it actually creates a lot of pressure on yourself you shouldn't mm -hmm. underestimate it. Once you put your face out there, right? And you're saying like, oh, I'm gonna to, going to do that. And I believe that. It is actually a lot of pressure, but it helps you to create like more boundaries and make this like initial, I would say very lofty idea more graspable and make it more into a company that has like a routine, right? Of mm -hmm. maybe like getting your first office, right? Going there every day. So these things you have to do rather quick in the beginning. Um, just to set yourself like boundaries and make they like, get this thing rolling and moving and create commitments that make you go there every day because I think the worst part is and I've heard this so many times you know some people sit in the evening talk about an amazing idea and then it yeah. just like fades out and I think it fades out because it can because there's nothing that forces you to keep going so I think that would be my advice to create something that at least lets you not quit within five minutes yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love this piece of advice. Um, Jessica, what does a day in your life look like when you're not immersed in the world of startups? What brings you, you know, genuine joy and um, helps you recharge? Um, I love, I love to be outside. Uh, so I love everything that's about, like I said, like maybe hiking, you know, or like 
I, I feel like anything that's good activity, being outside, uh, moving. Um, so more like I would say sports, um, exploring new things, trying new things out. Uh, and that also helps me a lot, right? Because it does create your balance. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not always as good as I want to be in meditating. Um, mm-hmm. There are times when I'm better and there are times when I'm worse. But I do feel, you know, going for a walk is like at least equally accepted in my daily accomplishment sheet. Yeah. Love it. Um, Jessica, so let's imagine now that we are in a movie theater and you're giving the audience a sneak peek of the future of banking. Um, how do you see emerging technologies and shifting customer expectations shaping the financial landscape? Yeah, I think it will be. I think it will be quite exciting because I think there's a couple of trends that are coming together. Uh, from I mean, just from from the work um, environment, everything is getting more international, right? Like mm-hmm. people are working from different places. You have like remote work, but maybe you have also like customers that are based in the US. Maybe the next ones are based in. Uh, Poland, right? So you have to deal with more currencies, maybe more entities. So we're creating this much more, I would say, we're creating more complexity through this like internationalization. And mm-hmm. banking is still very, very local. So you choose your local bank, right? And, mm-hmm. and you have to stick with it. You move to another country and maybe you have to open another bank that you can use there. But there's not this piece that connects all of it and that gives you maybe also the best of both worlds. And I feel like this is actually a direction where banking is moving towards. Will have like some sort of layer on top um, that like allows you to pick and choose from the best that banks have to offer, right? So imagine, I mean, you're in like Germany, right? And you realize I wanna, I have some customs in the US, but also like interest rates in the US are great. And I don't wanna like, put all my money into German banks because you never know what happens you know maybe there is like in the future like a default of any bank and they have to like all the other banks have to save it and you don't know right so you just want to maybe shuffle with one uh, click like 20% of your capital into like a US bank and that like all from one place without going through it like I would say boring KYC process and I think it's all about this let's make banking as international as people are always trying are already becoming and i think this will be quite an exciting uh, future exciting indeed um jessica it was actually the last questions that i um, had for you today maybe to end it off um maybe you can tell the audience like what what do you have going on uh, currently maybe some exciting projects or uh some new adventures planned either within the uh, Pal Capital or outside of it? Cool. Um, I mean, <laughs> every day um, I'm, I'm seeing some exciting projects on, on Pile side. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the team. I think, you know, it's, it's much more coming together. Uh, I mean, we're, we're also only one and a half years old and I feel I'm quite excited how people are growing together and we see things going into the right direction. I think we're launching some really uh, exciting new features, uh, everything around, I would say, auto payments and also like AI infused payments. So that's uh, yeah. something uh, I am quite excited about uh, that's coming soon. Besides that, hmm. Ah, we have a meetup today in, in Cape Town, but I think, uh, I don't know when the podcast is coming, so probably that's, that's not as relevant. <laughs> But nice, guys, so enjoy the meetup in Cape Town. Enjoy the beautiful Cape Town and the weather. Um, It was such a lovely time that um, I spent together with you here. I could talk to you for uh, another hour at least. And um, thank you so much, Jessica, for the time um, that you took to, uh, you know, join us on this podcast. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best with your endeavors and um, have a lot of fun in Cape Town. Thank you so much. Ciao. Ciao.